Uh, welcome to the New America Foundation. I'm Peter Berg and I run our national security program. It's a lot of a great deal of pleasure that I get to introduce J.M. Berger, who is the author of, I think, what is really a authoritative, definitive account of Americans who make the choice to go overseas to fight in overseas jihads. And I think it's particularly timely right now. We have the Kenyan government alleging that uh, one of the four attackers in the Eastgate Mall uh, was a Somali American. So far we only know an alias, um, but I think hopefully we'll find out a real name at some point. Um, we have the recent death of Omar Hamami, who J.M. Berger was in regular, uh, almost, I mean, more than regular contact. I mean, very, very close contact with over Twitter. Um, and uh, J.M. is a former business reporter. Uh, he's written one book. Uh, he has written, uh, been involved in a number of documentaries for National Geographic and other TV channels. And he's going to talk about the big themes about his book for about half an hour. And then I'm going to engage him in conversation. And then we're going to throw it open to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming. I always enjoy talking about the book, which is. Uh, been out here for a little while now and has, has really been a big help to me in, in getting to know people and working in this field. Um, the motivation for the book, you know, how I really got interested in this subject, sort of came in the mid-2000s when the mainstream media discovered the, that Americans were joining Al-Qaeda. And I think it was Adam Gadain, the uh, Al-Qaeda spokesman, who was in from uh, California, and when he first kind of came on the scene very visibly, I would turn on my TV pretty regularly and there would be somebody talking about this startling new development that Americans were joining Al-Qaeda. And my eventually I went from shouting at the television to <laughs> writing about this because they <laughs> had been Americans in Al-Qaeda from the very first day. Uh, the, the founding of Al-Qaeda the meeting at which that took place, uh, there was an American citizen there who was taking notes. And throughout the entire history of the organization and, and what we think of as this sort of modern jihadist movement, um, Americans have played a pretty important role. The first Americans that took part in what we would consider to be sort of this modern age of jihadism and terrorism uh, were at the Siege of Mecca in 1979. Uh, a group of about 400 militants uh, took over the Grand Mosque in Mecca and they came from a lot of different countries and there were two Americans in that group. One was killed and the other one was sent home. Uh, I put some energy into trying to track down the second one but never did. I heard rumors but I never heard anything that I could, I could take to press. Uh, and you know that, that event sort of marks the, the transition, the, the, the seeds of what we now see as Al-Qaeda. It's not necessarily a direct ideological line, but it, it was the kickoff of something. Um, at the same time that the siege at Mecca was happening, the Soviets invaded Afghanistan. And Americans were among the first foreign fighters to, to start going over there. Uh, there was at least one American fighting in Afghanistan in 1981 which is before almost anybody was there in terms of foreign fighters. Uh, I was able to document several dozen uh, American nationals, citizens, and long-term residents who went to fight during the jihad against the Soviets. Um, and I it would extrapolate that there were hundreds based on what I saw, because at the time of the Soviet jihad, no one was really targeting these guys. No one was keeping track of them. Uh, Pretty much no one cared. Uh, there was no count of all the foreign fighters in Afghanistan, let alone the Americans who went there. But uh, a really key recruiting network went through the United States. So the al Kifal Center in New York City, and also with branches in Tucson and Boston, uh, was the first and biggest uh, recruiting, recruiting hub for the Soviet Jihad. Abdullah Azam, who was the, the spiritual leader of the foreign fighters in Afghanistan, came to this country 
over and over again, gave speeches and openly recruited people to go and fight, uh, and attracted very little what we, you know, investigative scrutiny from, from the U.S. government. People were aware of him, but they weren't uh, tracking him as they would somebody with the same message today. At the same time, the U.S. really was very supportive of this effort. The State Department was putting out propaganda. Uh, I went to the National Archives and watched several videos that uh, the State Department had put out on the Afghan Mujahideen struggles, and they are uh, quite compelling arguments for jihad. Um, <laughs> you know, they're, they had no idea what they were looking at, what, what this was going to become. And so a lot of these people flew under the radar until toward the end of the war. In the late 80s, uh, the FBI and New York and New Jersey police started to notice that some of these guys were engaging in heavy training in this country, firearms training. There had always been some commerce in the training, training of Mujahideen in this country. Afghan Mujahideen came here under different auspices, possibly with the, at least with the blind eye of the government, if not with the support of the government. Um, but these guys were going to rifle ranges on the weekends and uh, they were talking about maybe robbing a casino to fund the jihad and robbing banks to fund the jihad. And the first scrutiny really started to come around that time. Uh, the group of people who were engaged in this training turned out to be pretty notorious by the end. Um, they came to the attention of the authorities who eventually decided they didn't have enough evidence to, to arrest them or to continue the investigation, and so a lot of them slipped away. One of those people was uh, an Egyptian immigrant named El Sayed Nasser, who was a follower of the blind sheikh, Abu Mar Abdel Rahman, and who assassinated a radical rabbi named Meir Kahane uh, in the early 90s. Another couple of people involved in this were involved in the World Trade Center bombing later, and one of the ringleaders of this training was a guy named Ali Muhammad, who was a naturalized American citizen who came here from Egypt, uh, got a visa through slightly unclear uh, means, and joined the U.S. Army. Uh, he became a sergeant, a supply sergeant at Fort, Fort Bragg, and so during the day he did logistics things and would occasionally be solicited for his opinions on uh, affairs in the Middle East, and you know, when he wasn't doing that, he was Xeroxing army field manuals <laughs> and maps and sending them back to Al-Qaeda. Uh, he wrote the first, uh, an American citizen wrote the first edition of the Encyclopedia of Jihad, which is the most notorious Al-Qaeda training manual, and a lot of that was cribbed and in some cases Xeroxed out of army field training manuals by Ali Muhammad. Uh, he, was, he spent four years in the Army, uh, and before he left in 1989, he took a leave of absence to go fight in Afghanistan, which appalled his commanding officer who sent it up the uh, chain of command and never heard back from anybody. He was like, you know, we really shouldn't have this <laughs> going on here. And, uh, you know, the diplomatic consequences of an American active duty American soldier fighting with the Mujahideen would have been pretty severe. <laughs> but it was a different world then. So Muhammad left the army and began conducting training for, for various groups uh, here. And he trained a lot of the people who were involved in the World Trade Center bombing, um, some of whom were American nationals and most of whom had been here for some time. These were not people who kind of parachuted in, uh, with the exception of the guy who knew how to build the bomb, Ramzi Youssef. Most of these guys had been living here for a while. They were, they were somewhat integrated into the United States. Um, and after the World Trade Center bombing, another group of followers of Omar Abdel Rahman wanted to take a, to upstage the World Trade Center bombing with an even bigger plot. And that one had an even higher percentage of Americans in it, including people who were born here, uh, people who had lived here all their lives. Uh, and all of this landed as a kind of an aberration. Uh, up until the World Trade Center bombing, there wasn't a real strong investigative focus on 
Islamic extremism. Uh, religion was considered a hands-off topic, and there were a handful of FBI agents who were very interested in the subject, and they would they were conditioned not to report very much about it because headquarters didn't like seeing references to religion in a report that went up the up the chain. Uh, after the World Trade Center bombing, that started to change. Uh, and while it did start to change, it changed slowly. The f initial investigation uh, into the World Trade Center bombing and the follow-up plot, which was called the Landmarks plot because they were going to destroy truck bombs on U.S. landmarks, New York City landmarks. Uh, after that investigation, they... FBI and the Joint Terrorism Task Force in New York found themselves overwhelmed with leads. They had an unbelievable mountain of information and they weren't able to pursue all of it. One of the things that, that was going on beneath the surface of this that no one really took note of was that uh, Americans were being recruited to fight in Bosnia as Mujahideen. U.S. military veterans in particular were in high demand for this. Uh, people connected to the landmark spot were working with people who had been in the military, had relationships with uh, people in the military, and they, when they found out about Muslim soldiers who were rotating out of the service, they would tap them and say, why don't you come to Bosnia and train the Mujahideen in Bosnia? And at least 25 Americans went, went to Bosnia and took part in that conflict. It's possibly more. Uh, about half of them came through this program, which had fallen on the desk of investigators and had fallen by the wayside because they, they just had too much, too much to investigate and they couldn't do it all. Even at that time, even though the World Trade Center bombing had kind of changed our attitude toward this, uh, it was still a conflict in which the United States had a vested interest. They were interested in the plight of the Muslims in Bosnia, who were, were under threat that the world community perceived as emanating from the Serbs. It was most definitely that. It was not quite as one-sided as it was sometimes depicted in the media, but basically the Muslims in Bosnia were the victims, and the United States wanted to help them, but there was no will to do so on the political arena for a very long time. And so, again, as in Afghanistan, we just kind of looked away, and uh, a number of people went and came back. And while they were in Bosnia, some of them made connections with Al-Qaeda, and those connections would take on increasing importance over the, year, over the years. So more than 50 Americans have been part of Al-Qaeda in some way. Uh, there are a, about two dozen that we know by name, and then there are a number more that you know we know of by reputation or we know an alias, uh, we see references to them. In the very early days, uh, these guys were there from the very beginning. Ali Mohammed was involved in Al-Qaeda from the very beginning. There was a guy from Kansas City named Mohammed Loe Bayezid. He was the one who was taking notes at the meeting that Al-Qaeda was founded, and he was involved with them for some years. Uh, before finally retiring, believe it or not. People do retire from Al-Qaeda. Um, another was a guy named Wadi al-Hajj, who was, had been living in Tucson and went to fight in Afghanistan. Uh, he had a crippled arm, so he ended up performing administrative support instead of getting into combat. And he was kind of an executive secretary to Azam, and he became that same function for bin Laden over, as the years went on. Um, all of these guys were involved in various ways in the 1998 East African Embassy bombings. And that's when U.S. authorities first really became aware in a, in a full way of the threat of Americans being part of Al-Qaeda. Uh, you know, there were a number of Americans who helped with that plot, whether it was in the planning stages, in the training, uh, Ali Muhammad cased some of the locations, it was involved in the planning, although he, uh, while he was doing this, he was also acting as an intelligence operator for Al-Qaeda. He was offered himself up as an asset to the FBI uh, and then tried to pump them for information. Uh, he was 
trying to double cross the intelligence community and people were aware of him well before this plot happened. At the same time, Al Qaeda was watching his activities and thought that maybe, I don't know, maybe this guy's like in over his head and maybe he's been turned the other direction. And uh, so he, by the time the actual World Trade Center bombing took place, Ali Muhammad was on the outs, but he was arrested anyway, as were several other Americans. Uh, I'm gonna just briefly uh, show this. This is a, uh, some of the networks related to Al Qaeda and to other, uh, other jihadist movements that have been operating in America over the years. And uh, this is the same map with some of the attacks that they've been connected to. Uh, this is slightly out of date, but you can get a sense that, you know, this wasn't a small thing. And uh, even, the, even though after the East African embassy attacks, it became a higher priority for the United States, it's still, until September 11th, it really didn't uh, rise to the level of having large dedicated investigations. All of this activity took place. Some of this is before 9-11, some of it is after 9-11, but the structure of Al-Qaeda and the secrecy around it made it difficult for people to understand that there was a real continuum of activity here, that this was all kind of related to each other. As we approach 9-11, we approach, you know, one of the most famous American jihadists, which is Anwar al-Laki. Uh, al-Laki had been a preacher. Uh, he was born in the United States. He was raised in Yemen, which is where his family was from. Came back to the United States to go to college. And this, his story is a pretty interesting one that is often confusingly represented in, in the coverage that we've seen about him. He was involved in radical networks pretty early. He had contacts with people who were known to be part of Al-Qaeda and part of the Blind Shakes network. But he presented himself as a moderate, and he was often hailed as sort of an example of a moderate Muslim. He did a lot of interviews in the immediate wake of 9-11. As sort of that iconic figure of you know somebody speaking up against terrorism, when in fact, the 9/11 hijackers had encountered him repeatedly uh, after they came into the United States, and the FBI had been investigating al Laki They, on a suspicion of a Hamas connection, they closed the investigation uh, a couple weeks before the hijackers arrived. So we don't know what the real connection was. We don't know if he actually played a direct role in inspiring them. Uh, and we don't know if, and this is what I think is more likely, is that one of his radical friends called him up and just said, there's a couple guys coming into town and we want you to take care of them. And he did that, no questions asked. And the reason I think he did that, no questions asked, is that he was actually on a flight back from San Diego on September 11th. So I don't think he would have chosen to fly that day if he had known what was coming. Uh, but certainly in the immediate aftermath, he knew who these guys were. And the investigation into him took a lot of troubled turns. He left, he left the country, uh, returned briefly, was detained uh, at an airport while the FBI figured out if they had enough to arrest him. They decided they didn't, and then he fled the country again. He became a very prominent and very effective spokesman for for Al-Qaeda and for jihadism. He was extremely articulate. Uh, he, his power was not, is, uh, is often described as being, he was fluent in English and he had a really good command of English and that's why he was so scary. Why he was scary in my opinion is that he had a, a really uncanny ability to relate the theological ideas of jihadism to real life examples. He would take the story, he would tell you a story from history and then he would say, so it's like this, if you're over at a guy's house for dinner and this happens and this happens, and you know, he was really good at making examples that people could, could latch on to. Uh, and he was a powerful speaker until he was killed by a US drone. He was involved in Inspire magazine, uh, English language magazine uh, that combines ideological support for Al Qaeda with practical instructions on how to build bombs and, and carry out terrorist attacks. Um, Inspire is not, by any stretch of imagination, the first uh, jihadist magazine targeting English recruits, although it certainly has been one of the most effective 
and one of the most best known, but Mujahideen Monthly, uh, and that's the 1990 edition, it was published throughout the 80s, uh, was one of several English language publications that targeted Americans and tried to recruit them into jihadist uh, paths. So Alaki was a good front man for this organization, but he was definitely not a trailblazer in attract, uh, trying to attract Americans. Um, Omar Hamami is another person who I talked about in my book. He is an American who joined Al-Shabaab in Somalia, which at the time that he went to Somalia, there was no Al-Shabaab. And uh, even throughout most of his tenure with Al-Shabaab, it was not uh, directly associated with Al-Qaeda until it made its formal de uh, declaration just a couple of years ago after the death of bin Laden. There were informal ties earlier. Uh, Hamami was a pretty interesting case. I did not, I gave him short shrift in the book because his notoriety at the time that I wrote the book was basically that he had appeared in a uh, Shabab video doing a rap song that was intended to recruit Americans into fighting with Al-Shabaab. Uh, what became more interesting about him was that he broke with Al-Shabaab very publicly. Uh, he released videos saying that Al-Shabaab was trying to kill him. His dispute was with them was multi-layered, but it had to do with corruption in the ranks and the fact that uh, According to him, al-Shabaab had tried to assassinate al-Qaeda members who were in Somalia trying to guide the organization. Uh, Hamami became a little bit of a celebrity on Twitter after this. He got online and he was using Twitter to, to air his grievances and try and drum up support among other Shabaab members in Somalia who were also on social media. And he was killed just a couple of weeks ago uh, by al-Shabaab after a very long period of conflict. Um, his cause eventually ended up being conflated with some of the most senior members of Al-Shabaab and some of the sounding members. And uh, unfortunately for them, uh, the emir of Al-Shabaab, Ahmed Godan, uh, is a pretty bloody guy. And uh, he basically killed almost everybody who was standing against him. Um, we're running short on time. I'm just going to quickly uh, talk about this and then uh, I think we'll turn it over for the Q&A. Um, there was no profile of the Americans I looked at. I looked at about 300 cases for the book. I've looked at more since then. It's, there's no single type of person who gets attracted to this and there's no clear profile for why Americans join Al-Qaeda. Um, there is the perception. Uh, these, these, these traits are a list of qualities that appeared repeatedly in the in the sample group, but you can't sort of say take one from column A, one from column B, and if you see that, you should call the FBI because this guy's into it. Um, the the universal kind of perception that these guys share is that there is a, a war on Islam that is being carried out by the West, and very few of these guys would argue to you that they are fighting a defensive war. They, are, they feel they are defending themselves. Some of them see and hope for an offensive war at the end of this process after they have finished casting the United States out of the Middle East. But when you get pulled in, you get pulled in because you feel you're under attack uh, and not because you're necessarily because you're out to attack someone. Um, some of these are also inconsistent. So, you know, some people will have one end of the spectrum and some people will have the other. So on the one hand, you have people who are very idealistic and altruistic who get into this because their utopian beliefs about what Islam can do for the world or their connection to the, to the Muslim Ummah. Uh, then on the other hand, on the f other far end of the spectrum, you get people who are just thugs or are violent tendencies. They have a past of a history with violence and this gives them an outlet for that violence that has some moral cover. Um, Ideology is usually present. It's hard to look at this and point to cases where ideology, a religious ideology, is the one thing that sent somebody out the door to actually take part in violence. Um, but it's a huge reinforcer. When you, when you have the idea in your head and you're looking for reasons to do it, that's when ideology comes into play. And it's an important magnifier of your attraction to that. Um, identity politics is a pretty universal uh, you, you take part in these movements because you have an overwhelming sense of identification with your, your religious 
or uh, political religious organization and that's one reason that we don't see more lone wolves and we don't see more effective lone wolves is that if it, a movement is based around a overwhelming feeling of connection to a community it's very difficult for somebody to stay at home and never talk to anybody and never reveal their plans to anyone you you always want to reach out you want to be surrounded by people who are like you so it makes it much harder and much more of an anomaly uh, when we see these lone wolf cases alienation is present sometimes some of these people are social misfits of one kind or another but that is definitely not universal uh, omar hamami was a very good example of that he was a very popular kid uh, who had a lot of uh, charm and charisma and he was he was well liked by his peers and he took off on this path anyway he could have done other things um, he wasn't stilted or stunted in that sense but you do see that sometimes but it's not as common as as I think some of our early assumptions about terrorism think uh, Arabization is just uh, one thing that you see pretty consistently with people who get enough involved in these movements to commit violence is that they will adopt traits of Arab culture. They will start dressing in Arab ways. You will see a lot of these guys like Adam Gadain and Hamami uh, start to speak with a sort of strange nowhere accent that, that you know, is not really an Arabic accent, but they're just trying to sound foreign. Uh, one thing that was interesting with Hamami is last interview with Voice of America before his death, uh, he, he did a radio interview with a reporter and he you could hear the Alabama in his voice so clearly he was under duress and you could hear him he sounded American for the first time in in some years so uh, and finally uh, fetishization of sex and women so there's you know there's a pop psychology approach to this sometimes people like to talk about repressed sexual impulses having to do with this movement and you know, there's not, there's not good evidence to support that theory, but the fact is, is that what you do see as a pretty common theme in this, in other extremist movements too, is the role of women as sort of emblematic victims of the oppression that you're trying to fight. And uh, in addition to that, I think that you do see, for some of these guys, uh, you do see some motivation of sexual impulse. So a Bosnian government official told me during the war that uh, people would come up to the embassy and they'd be like, I heard there are a lot of widows in Bosnia. For anybody who's going to go fight, we could go marry them. And, you know, uh, and you see similar kinds of strains throughout this. It's not a universal trait. I think it's something that probably deserves some uh, examination in a, in a kind of serious-minded way that it hasn't gotten yet. So... I will stop at that and we'll have a conversation. Thank you very much for JM for uh, that extremely clear um, history and analysis of the phenomenon. Um, first question is um, uh, presumably joining a, I mean, there's, if you're an American citizen, you join um, an Al Qaeda affiliate. Um, you know, it's, that's clearly um, illegal, right? I mean, you're, yeah. uh, you will be charged with a, a crime. Um, but talk to us about the, uh, this, this, the Neutrality Act, right? So Americans are not supposed to engage in overseas combat. Um, so when Ali Mohammed, for instance, went to Afghanistan to fight with the Mujahideen, uh, we didn't know that he was associated with Al Qaeda at the time, and it wouldn't have been a crime because we didn't even know it existed uh, at that point. Um, so, it, but it would have been a violation of the Neutrality Act. It's uh, strange because law enforcement hates the Neutrality Act for reasons that aren't quite clear to me. I've asked that question several times in relation to this and to other cases, in more recent cases too, such as in Syria, and they do not like to bring new prosecutions under the Neutrality Act. Um, why, why is that? I'm not sure. Uh, I haven't been able to get a real clear answer on that. 
I, well, now this guy I mean, there were neutrality act investigation was the one that first spotted Ali Muhammad, huh. and but then it was quickly transformed from a neutrality act investigation to a criminal investigation. And so. what does the neutrality act say? Uh, it's illegal for an American to take part as a combatant in a conflict that the United States is not part of. I think is yeah, that sounds yeah. So so for instance, this guy uh, is it Eric Karun who mm -hmm. was. Uh, he was, by his own account, associating with Al Nusra in Syria in 2013. So, do, do we? I mean, he's been indicted. Was it under the Neutrality Act or joining Al Nusra or material support? Or I, I want to say it's material support. But yeah, that I sounds right. Want to look that up? Yeah. Uh, Eric Haroun's a pretty interesting case because uh, the guy does not seem to be particularly really ideologically involved. He seems like more in the mold of a Hemingway type adventurer who like wanted to go take part in a fun war that seemed like it had right on its side. Yeah, it you was know? happening at the time, so yeah. I'm going to join it. So in his, tell, us, tell us a little bit, a bit about him. I mean, one thing is that he was also publicizing on Facebook and Twitter. Yeah, and he, was, he wasn't uh, keeping any of this to himself. No, I mean, in fact, he, his case probably, if he just kept quiet, he might be still yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, there are some Americans fighting in Syria. Uh, we don't have a real good inventory of them. The estimates I see are run from at least 10 to as many as 60, could be more. Most of them keep a pretty low profile. Uh, Eric Haroon did not. He, was, he had a Facebook page that he just, like, continually updated with pictures of, here I am with the guys from al-Nusra, and here I am with the guys from Amar al-Sham. And uh, he didn't seem to comprehend that he was doing anything wrong. And in fact, when he came back to the United States and was arrested, he was kind of floored. He was like, wait a minute, I didn't think I was doing anything wrong. Well, because uh, there is some similarity to the Afghan case where our stated goal at the time seemed to be the overthrow right. of the Assad regime, particularly by when he was initially going. Right, I mean, and there's, I think it's, there's a social stigma attached to this now. I think pe Americans, are educated about the adjacent dangers of this movement and the fact that Al Qaeda is involved there. I mean, during the Afghan Jihad, there was nobody fighting on the side of the Arabs who was clearly classified as an enemy of America. And that's different now. And so, I mean, even if there are 60 Americans fighting in Syria, uh, that percentage wise is probably less turnout than, uh, than what they were able to accomplish in Afghanistan. At this comparable stage in the, in the war. Your, your book is called Jihad Joe. There are very few Jihad Janes. There was Nihak, Nicole Mansfield, who was a 33-year-old from Flint, Michigan, who was killed in Syria earlier this year. Mm -hmm. Maybe associated with al-Nusra, the al-Qaeda affiliate. Is that correct? I've heard of that, but I haven't investigated it yeah. directly. But and she's an outlier? They are. There are a handful of women who get involved in the movement, uh, Western women. The, there are pockets where, for instance, in yeah, I'm sure you saw the stories out of Russia over mm -hmm. the last week about uh, their excessive concerns over female suicide bombers. There are little pockets of uh, women who take part in the movements generally, and then there are a very small handful of Western women, such as another one who's been written about a lot lately is Samantha Luthwaite. Yeah. She's been written about in great quantity, well, who but is she? not quality. Uh, she was married to one of the 7-7 bombers in London, and uh, she's a, a British woman, a white British woman, and she is believed to be involved with Al-Shabaab in some capacity. Uh, and then once you get past that basic statement, I've read a lot of stuff about her, and I don't know how much of it to believe. Well, a lot of it turned out to be, I mean, she was, there was yeah. early reporting that she might have been involved in the Kenya attack, but it's yeah. pretty clear from the video that, that has been recovered that there's no white female directing the operation and then like right. a lot of reports of these kinds of things. I, I, when they, I was asked about it on CNN, I was like, that doesn't sound right at all. And I, you know, it was news to me. And because, because your point, you know, for a start, these guys are huge misogynists. They don't want, they, and, 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 and Al-Shabaab was tweeting through, uh, and it seemed like a legitimate tweet that we, did, we don't have females in these operations. Yeah. And it wasn't, I mean, the idea that she might have been on the sidelines helping with financing, well, that seems plausible. but. That she would be involved in an operation didn't didn't feel right. I mean, we don't still there's still a lot of things we don't know about it, but it doesn't seem to be true. Yeah, the reporting on her has been really bad. I get a lot of questions. You about know, so it. much of it is being British reporting, which yes. is of course it's part it's of the funny. problem. 
<laughs> it's it, it, not exactly. It's a little spotty. Uh, you know, there's a report. One of the things that the British have reported is that there's a Twitter account called NYC Press, which is a Kenyan-based Shabab sympathizer, and they claim that that is Samantha Luthwaite. And I've had some exchanges with her on Twitter. Uh, we tried to get her to admit that she was Samantha Luthwaite, but she would not. Well, this is an Al-Shabaab, this is interesting because this is an Al-Shabaab Twitter account, this one you're talking about. It's Al-Shabaab friendly. Al-Shabaab affiliated. Yeah, but I mean, whoever is writing this is writing in a kind of English that you pick up in, in London or Minneapolis. I mean, it's very kind of, yeah. it's not somebody speaking English as a second language at all. Yeah, well, Al-Shabaab's main Twitter account also seemed, like, seemed that way. Uh, that account has been... Uh, permanently deleted at this point, I think. Tell us a little bit about your role in getting Twitter to take down these accounts, and and what what is the Twitter? Because you know, Twitter isn't kind of in the same space that, in a way, that YouTube was a few years back, where you know, people are all sorts of people are using it, including terrorists, mm -hmm. and suddenly they've got to make some hard decisions about kind of how they deal with this and their terms of use. So, what are their terms of use, and how do you? You've had the Al Shabaab Twitter account taken down. How many people are following? How quickly does it get taken down, and why? So, Twitter uh, it has a very permissive uh, terms of use. They allow a, a really wide range of content, and they are extremely reluctant to suspend accounts for their content. Direct, specific threats of violence has, until now, been the standard that you have to meet to to get your account suspended. So. Unless, and, and when they say direct and specific, they are highly stringent. I mean, I'd have to tweet, Peter Bergen, I'm going to kill you. Mm -hmm. And that would be specific enough for them to Not, I'm going to come to New America Foundation and maybe kill right. somebody there. Right. Well, if I, if I said that, that might be specific enough. If I said somebody should kill all those people at the New America Foundation. That would not be that enough. That would not be enough. Interesting. So this became, this had come up before. I had written about it before. And... Uh, had written about Twitter's standards for, for termination, and I started watching the Al Shabaab account. I watch a lot of Al Shabaab Twitter accounts that are used mostly are used by actual members, which I, I'll come back to. The, the primary PR account had accumulated a lot of followers, about 24,000 followers as of January of this year. And uh, during when they were holding some French hostages, they tweeted that they were going to execute those hostages. So mm. I saw this as an opportunity for a, an experiment. And I reported it to Twitter because it was extremely On specific. And when you reported violence. it, you reported it through their kind of yes. site? Yes, they have an uh, yeah. extremely arcane system for reporting abuse, which is d designed to discourage you from doing it, basically. And how quickly did they take it down? They took it down probably 24 hours after I put that report in. Uh, so that was January. Shabab came back on. One of the reasons I was interested in this is there's a lot of discussion in the community about countering violent extremism and how to do it. And there's a lot that's been written by very well-respected academics in the field, some of whom are my friends, who say there's no point in trying to get these guys knocked offline because it doesn't accomplish anything. They just come back and it's status quo. It's whack-a-mole is the joke. It's like playing whack-a-mole at the arcade. And so I didn't, I suspected this wasn't true. And so <laughs> after Al-Shabaab was suspended, after I reported them and got them suspended, I tracked how their followers came back and the rate at which their followers were coming back. and. Their followers came back at a much slower rate. They, it, the, the projection that I did after the first couple of months was that it would take them at least a year to get back up to 20,000 if they ever did. So, so takedowns for the Twitter, I mean, because the, the counter argument going back three years, the YouTube argument would be, look, if you take down an Al key video on YouTube, is this going to be posted somewhere else? And that seems like a fairly plausible. Well, yes, but uh, so Al Shabaab did come back after about a week after this first suspension. But the January. followers were down, right? We, it's limiting their reach. Their reach. It's it's you know when you weed your garden, you don't expect that weeds will never come back. Mm. Uh, you are trying to manage the problem, and it, this is a way of managing the reach that these guys have. Now, during the Eastgate 
Kenya Mall attack, you said, I think you told me that there were five accounts were up and taken down during that. Right. So they started live tweeting during the mall attack. Uh, Which is, by the way, I think the first time in history that a terrorist attack has been tweeted in live. It's live. Well, live. Uh, they have tweeted attacks in Mogadishu. Okay. Uh, they have some tweeted uh, some Was attacks in Somalia, mm -hmm. but they were small. Yeah, they were r roughly real time. Right. I mean, this this. this thing in this case was that the actual siege went on for so long right. that it overlapped. But they have tweeted while they've been attacking. And in fact, uh, just this week they were tweeting, well, there's no official account anymore, but members of Al-Shabaab were tweeting about some of act, uh, an attack on the Kismayo airport uh, just yesterday as mm -hmm. it was happening. Um, so yeah, but the, because their, that account was known to reporters. So there's, there's an official Al-Shabaab account uh, after the first account was terminated, they have spokesmen who have the phone numbers of reporters, and they call the reporters they know, and they say, this is our new official account. So, And they call you? No, they don't call me. Why uh, not? I have not made contact with their spokesman. And they, they, of course, so now I'm also known as the guy who's constantly trying to get them knocked off Twitter, so they would have additional reasons. Have they tweeted me. about you? NYC Press has, Samantha Lothwaite. Uh, in fact, I have it linked from my Twitter bio. Uh, her compl complaint that uh, I was on their most hated Kafars list. So sounds like a good list to be on. Yeah, well, it has its <laughs> pros and cons, I guess. But uh, yeah, I mean, and I, I have talked to some of them in the course of interacting with Hamami too. I've talked to talked to different members. But how did you uh, start engaging with Hamami, and what was the process, and how many? I mean, you, he he was a prolific tweeter, right? I he mean, was. So he, you and some other, and did, how did that all happen? Well, he started off, uh, he showed up to post this video saying that Al-Shabaab was trying to kill him, which was news to all of us. And that Al-Shabaab was trying to kill him. Yes. He posted a video on YouTube, and then he created a Twitter account to promote that video. And, and by the way, do you have any, you know, how is he, you know, I, I'm presuming he's like in Somalia in the middle of nowhere you know, with no access to anything. I mean, by the, the account of his biography, he was, it's not like he's living. So how was he setting these things up? Phone. Phone. Mostly phone. Uh, and Somalia has like very high cell phone coverage. Uh, it, it's erratic, uh, but there are uh, portions. So when he was on the run, sometimes he would go silent for a while because he was out of coverage area. Okay. But uh, yeah, there's decent enough uh, coverage that he was able to do, particularly Twitter. It became easier after he really went on the run uh, he mostly used Twitter because it's easier to use on a bad connection. Mm. Um, so he posted this video, he made a Twitter account to promote it, and he started uh, following me and several other people who write about terrorism on, and started trying to get uh, our attention. And at first I ignored this because I didn't want to, my general policy is not to promote accounts associated with extremists. People always ask me for like lists of accounts and stuff. And I almost never provide that because I don't see why I should do these guys' jobs for them. And then Hamami posted his autobiography. He wrote a pretty extensive autobiography of his life up to 2007, which was he had embedded within this uh, what he thought were clues to why Al-Shabaab wanted to kill him now. And he embedded them so deeply that nobody noticed them. <laughs> and uh, so he st I tweeted about the autobiography, which had a lot of humorous bits about uh, being bit by bugs and explosive bowel movements. And it's like and a 150 pages. I mean, yeah. it's, it's very detailed, yeah. like starting with his first high school teacher. And, and how everybody loved him everywhere he went. And it was uh, a strange thing. And so I, I tweeted about it, making fun of it. And he was complaining to me on Twitter about this, and I was still not interested in engaging him, but I emailed him and said, okay, why don't we do an interview? If, you know, he was complaining that nobody, nobody got what he was trying to do, and so I did an interview with him in which he explained to me all the coded references. Was this a phone interview or a Twitter interview? This was email, uh, email. before he was, he was, he was uh, hiding out, but he wasn't on the run at that point, so he still had access to a computer. He could write longer emails and, and right. longer pieces. And so we had several email exchanges. I published a story about it in Foreign Policy. And after that, 
we had sporadic contact. So he would get annoyed with me and sort of go away for a while, and then he would come back, and we would exchange direct messages, which are private exchanges on, on Twitter. He lost his email access at some point, so this was all on Twitter at, at, at that How stage. many messages do you ex did you exchange with him? Mm. Hundreds. Yeah, hundreds. I mean, we were in contact. It was off and on for a while. After we did the interview, uh, there were a few exchanges that were private, and then... Uh, did you come to like him? It's, it's hard to describe <laughs> exactly. What uh, us? What? He was uh, engaging and he was funny, and but he was also very committed to Al Qaeda and had made terrible, terrible decisions about his life. And we had an exchange at one point where you know where he's like, you know, worried about getting killed, and uh, you know, uh, my and I actually said to him, "It's like I, you know, it's hard to root for you in this situation because I think your story ends with you know." blowing up a bus full of school children or something. Uh, and, and there is evidence, we think, that he killed somebody. He said uh, in an interview with uh, Spencer Ackerman at Wired that he had killed a uh, prisoner, Ethiopian prisoner, that al-Shabaab had taken in a battle. Beyond that, he did not seem to have taken part in anything that resembled combat or terrorism, uh, despite many intelligence sources saying otherwise. And Al-Shabaab, his critics in Al-Shabaab said the same thing, so I'm inclined to believe it. Both he and, and the people who were, came out of the woodwork to, to blast him when he started criticizing the organization agreed that he had not had any significant military role. So he was sort of a wannabe with a high profile. A lot of Westerners end up in that situation, especially in Al-Shabaab, but also in AQAP. The Americans go over, they are prized for their media value more than their operational and Adam Gadan seems to be a classic example of this. Yes. The, cla the kind of classic counterexample would be Shukra Juma, who is, seems to be the head of Al-Qaeda's operations now, who is responsible for the Najibullah Zazi plot. Yeah, Shukra Juma was Tell us about him. born in, uh, I believe, Saudi Arabia, right? And yeah. uh, was raised there, came here as a teenager. So he's not as American as, as some of these other guys. And when they want to put an American, the reason they they put the white guys on, basically, because they want, because they know that they're going to get a lot of press in the United States when they put a white guy on videotape spouting Al Qaeda gibberish. And so Shukr Juma is, is an Arab, and uh, he had only been here for some years in, in his uh, upbringing. So. Well, and also he seems to be deeply involved in real Al Qaeda operations and right. therefore maybe keeping a really low profile. Right. Uh, you know, not, not too many American, Americans have been involved in Al-Qaeda operations at a really fundamental level. So he is an exception on that. But again, he's also arguably less American than, than some of the you others. You mentioned this guy, Bayezid, who was from Kansas City, who was taking notes at the first meeting of Al-Qaeda. Do we know what's happened to him? Has he disappeared without trace? He was, didn't Larry Wright interview him in Sudan? Larry Wright interviewed him, and uh, I asked uh, him, Larry Wright, to introduce me when I was writing the book. He tried to, he reached out to him, and uh, he was very wary. He had retired from Al-Qaeda. He was very wary of talking to anybody because every time the press came up, he started getting a hard time from people in Sudan where he was living. And his, Do we think uh, he's still there? His email account, after, after a while, he, he didn't respond to the last message that I had passed through uh, Mr. Wright. And then he, his email account started bouncing spam, started sending out spam, and that was the last we, we heard from him. So I'm not sure what his current status is. You know, on your slide, you had a, a reference to a group called Fukra. Uh, who, who are they and, and why are they interesting? Al Fukra is a, a strange case. Uh, they are. It was a group that was founded out of Pakistan. They follow a Pakistani sheikh, but it's primarily African Americans. And it came out of the sort of black nationalist movements of the 70s. Really, it's kind of a outgrowth of uh, those movements and sort of the Nation of Islam strain. Um, they are separatists, like racial separatists. They they want to live apart. They uh, have their own. Compounds. They have their own. They do. They have. Uh, a number of compounds around the country, which and I'm Canada, always I amazed at. Yeah, in Canada too. Uh, I'm always amazed at how little press they get because you would think people would be more alarmed about that kind of thing. But they, I think maybe the reason they, 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 they seem to have engaged in a lot of like anti-Sikh and anti, 
sort of like in the, in the yeah. 70s and 80s, and yeah. then they seem to have stopped the violence, and that may be the reason that they... Yeah, they were, they were pretty violent in the 70s and 80s. They were attacking Sikh temples. Yes, uh, and uh, they were involved in the murder of a liberal imam in, in Tucson, uh, yeah. Rashid Khalifa, uh, who was, that was also tied to al-Qaeda through... Wadi Al Haj, who I mentioned was the executive secretary to Bin Laden, uh, had scouted out the the mosque, and then Al Fuqa remembers assassinated the imam. Who there was a that's a very complicated story about <laughs> why they did that. But uh, since after they were suspected of being involved in the World Trade Center bombing, of having some members who were involved, and then after that they really have kept to themselves in a in a much bigger way, and they haven't been violence, so they have not gotten a lot of press scrutiny anyway. Before I throw it open, just tell us a little bit about, this is, you know, a massive piece of research that you had to do, like, and you show the Buj monthly on the screen, and, and tell us how you approach the research, what were the most useful avenues to nail some of this stuff down, get these materials? Well, a lot of the sources I had, uh, the first half of the book takes place really is the pre-9-11 era, and a lot of my resources on that were court documents, transcripts. Uh, I had wiretap transcripts. I talked to the investigators who worked on the Landmarks case and the World Trade Center bombing. They were able to share with me, you know, wiretap transcripts and, and videotapes and stuff. So I was really able to get the voices of, of a lot of those people. Um, and I also did a lot of Freedom of Information Act documents. And then I interviewed several of them. I talked to Clement Hampton L., who was one of the more colorful people involved in the Landmarks plot. Uh, He's emailed still in jail. With him. Yes, we emailed it with him in prison. He was uh, interesting to talk to, although not inclined to answer any of my actual questions. Because he had fought in the Afghan war. He'd lost a leg. Then he was in, indicted for the f Trade Center attack. Or yes, the, uh, the follow-up follow attack. The Landmarks, Landmarks attack. Well, you know, the thing... One thing that really helped with him is that his attorney did something that's very questionable legally, but was great for me, was that he told this guy's story in unbelievable depth. He like told this guy's life story. He kept arguing that it was relevant to the prosecution, which it really wasn't. But To the defense. Yes. Yeah. But unlike the other attorneys, he, he just lobbied and lobbied and lobbied to get this stuff in. So there's like three straight days of testimony about his entire life story, yeah. including him testifying. So I was able to really capture his voice and personality through a lot of that. I interviewed his wife. Uh, and she's living in the Bronx? Or yes. Uh, she was, she was a, actually a great character. She tried to, she thought he was an idiot. She loved him, but she thought he was kind of a fathead. So. Um, well, it's a great book. Um, let's throw it open to anybody who has a question. Please identify yourself. Wait for the mic. Um, and who's going to ask the first question. Start with Mike Rowlands here in front. Hi, thank you very much for your time and for coming down today. Um, as we mentioned out in the hallway before you came in, there's a fair number of people in and out of the government trying to figure out this whole countering violent extremism, how to go about it, who owns which lane in the road, et cetera. And a lot of the conversation comes to the indicators and the warnings that you, some of which you put up there. Based on what you said and what others have researched and written about, there really being not even a common theme or no definitive, here's the list. In your view, is that still worthwhile time spent trying to figure out what is it we're looking for? And I'd be interested in your thoughts on what has the government or the private sector not done to try to identify these people you might think is worth doing. Thank you. So, yeah, the, the problem with countering violent extremism initiatives is that so far a lot of it has been focused extremely broadly. So people are like interested in getting people before they become radicalized. You see this over and over again. They want to get them before they become radicalized and convince them not to become radicalized. So there are a number of problems with this premise. First of all being that there's no way to know which people are going to be radicalized and which ones won't. The second one being that if you intervene with somebody, uh, you might push them the other direction because they might say, Fuck, the government's coming in here and busting me because I read a book online and like, you know, hell with this, I'm, I'm signing up now. Uh, so I think that there's, uh, you know, there's a legitimate 
interest in, in countering violent extremism because it's theoretically, if you can figure out how to do it, it's cheaper and less destructive than fighting wars and, and having to bust people. But honestly, crime prevention is, is, you know, doing basic law enforcement work is the best way to prevent violent extremism, preventing attacks. After that, you can also identify there are different ways, and I've been working on this on the social media front, and it's kind of the golden goose that everybody in Washington is chasing, is how do you diagnose where somebody is on the spectrum from what you can see of them in public? So if you know there are 10,000 people in the United States who are following al-Qaeda-related Twitter accounts, how can you find the ones who are more likely to be getting involved? Um, I think there are, you, if you're going to pick your point of intervention, you need to put it as close to the illegal act as possible. Uh, because otherwise you're, you're spending a lot of energy on people who might never, might never go. Um, that said, it's, it's a difficult field and there's not a lot of good quality data about this. So I've been, uh, you know, kind of pushing to s get people people or myself involved in, in doing research that could give us, you know, better resolution on some of these questions. One of the things that we've been doing here at New America, which I think Mike knows a little bit about, but is that one of our sort of, for all the reasons you've just outlined, one th way of thinking about this was that we have convened uh, people from Google and Facebook and also Muslim community leaders, imams, etc so that they have basic training to understand how the internet works. Because um, if you can't um, take down bad speech, at least you can produce better speech. Um, and the, the people who are going to counter the al message with any degree of um, you know, actual uh, impact are people who can engage with him theolo theologically and speak English, but a lot of them don't really understand very well how the, you know, things like Google rankings or, or these other so it's not, and, and I think, as you say, the, the indicators for what works, there aren't none. I mean, if it, right. the indicator for, for something, I mean, a bomb that doesn't go off doesn't register. Um, a person who is merely a radical but not a violent radical doesn't really register. So I, I think it's, but I think having a conversation, I mean, clearly it's good to have start having the conversation. And I think that, you know, NCTC, because I, I know, it's the, you know, they, they would take, they would go around the country and show pictures of al Lauki online, and it was shocking to the Muslim community leaders that they were meeting with because they had no idea that al Lauki was out there and that was saying these things and was so persuasive. Um, I took part in a study, uh, a piece of research, and published a paper on it about, uh, it's more than a year ago now, um, I think it was April 2012, and we took we looked at the uh, a, a set of followers of prominent white extremists, uh, white nationalists online, mm. and we were able to develop metrics that could take this group, which was about 3,500 uh, accounts, Twitter accounts, and identify with some degree of accuracy the people who are most heavily engaged in the ideology. Hmm. So, based on publicly available information. Yes, uh, all open source, all based on huh. relationships, network relationships, social interaction. Not based on uh, like a lot of people are working on linguistic approaches to this, where we look for keywords that indicate somebody's going to do this or that or the other thing. This is content blind approach. It doesn't necessarily catch all the people who are heavily involved, but what it does is it takes that list of 3,500 uh, out of which about 44% were overtly involved in tweeting about white nationalism in a positive way. Mm. And you could reduce that to a list of the top 100 that was 90, 95% accurate mm. and the top 200 list that was 87% accurate. So there are ways to triage these systems and one of the, th the this particular approach, which I'm still pursuing more research on, uh, one of the things you could do, for instance, is uh, if you are trying to put a link out that goes to a story that you think has a powerful counter-extremism content, you could measure how it goes into the system, how it spreads to the people who are most engaged versus the people who are less engaged, different types of engagement. And you can measure sort of quantitatively. First, you can measure how your message is received. And secondly, you can monitor this community over time and see 
whether the amount of engagement is going down. Because mm. there's a quantitative number that is like there's this much engagement in the system. And if you are succeeding in counter-programming against these guys, then that number should go down. So I think there are some promising ways to, to approach this problem. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to do the next chunk of research, basically, how to get it funded and uh, where to publish and, and for whom. So, Gentleman here. <laughs> Thanks. My name is Steve Hirsch. I'm a journalist. Uh, I was interested in your comments on uh, uh, black nationalist groups uh, and their links. And I wonder if you could tell us anything more about that. I was also, before you said that, was going to ask you about <coughs> what I thought might have been counterintuitive, but uh, the link with white nationalist groups uh, that uh, came up uh, in regard to lone wolf theory some years ago. But I was wondering if there's any, uh, but this is different than lone wolves, I understand yeah. it. But I was wondering <laughs> if, there, if there's any nexus there. Thanks. Sure. Uh, very, uh, to keep this, like, condense a lot of history into a very couple of, of sentences. Uh, the, the early strains of Islam in this country, when it really, yeah, there were always Muslims, Orthodox Muslims in America. But when you really started seeing big numbers was when the, Nation of Islam became, and, and its precursor groups like the Moorish Science Temple became popular, and they attracted people with a mix of racial separatism or superiority arguments and a pretty uh, muddled view of Islam, a translation of Islam into a vernacular that didn't much resemble where it had come from. And during the 70s and 80s, Saudi Arabia poured a tremendous amount of money into regularizing this community of sort of black separatists and black nationalist Muslims into Orthodox Islam, uh, which to the Saudi idea of Orthodox Islam, so, you know, comes with its attendant uh, complications. So they would fly uh, prominent leaders to, to Saudi Arabia uh, and put them up and send them to college and uh, to religious college and they for the most part succeeded in establishing Orthodox Islam as a, as a alternative to Nation of Islam so that that movement's still there but it's increasingly irrelevant uh, and it's when it is relevant it often resembles traditional Islam more um, as far as the, the white nationalist uh, nexus, the, the key part of that really is, comes down to this idea of leaderless resistance. So Louis Beam was a famous Klansman and seditionist uh, in Texas who uh, has a long and storied history, which is its own, probably its own book someday. Um, he developed an idea that he had actually cribbed from, I think, a South American revolutionary of leaderless resistance. The problem that the white supremacists had in the 80s and 90s was that their movement was being heavily infiltrated by the FBI and the leaders were being arrested and going to jail. And so his solution to this was that we're going to have this thing called leaderless resistance and everybody's just going to self-organize into tiny cells of one or two or three people who are just going to act independently without getting guidance from above. And that goes back to what I said about identity politics. It's very difficult to make that model work when you're an identity movement. Because if you're a white supremacist, it's because you, partly because you hate black people, but it's also partly because you love white people and you want to associate with people who have the same values as you do. And so inevitably, you know, you see these things that look like lone wolf cases and in a lot of cases they turn out not to be because the people have extensive contacts with, with people within the movement. Uh, the Oklahoma City bombing being a pretty prominent example of that, where uh, Timothy McVeigh, regardless of whether he had additional help from people who have not been indicted yet, which I think he did, he definitely had a lot of contact in the movement, including probably with Lewis Beam. So uh, this idea was rediscovered after 9-11 by an uh, al-Qaeda ideologue named Abu Musa al Sari, who recast it as leaderless jihad, and it's basically the same idea. 
and it's working out for Al-Qaeda basically as well as it worked out for the white supremacists, which is not all that well. In the age of the internet, it's almost impossible to be a lone wolf because Major Nadal Hassan really, I mean, he was a social misfit. He really didn't, you know, kind of communicate, but he still reached out to uh, al Lauki. And I mean, I'm wondering if the term lone wolf has any meaning anymore uh, because, I mean, you had a pair of lone wolves in Boston, but you know, Tamerlane was reaching, you know, he kind of went to Dagestan to try and meet the great jihadi war heroes and it yeah. didn't really work out. But there are very few people, I mean, we're social animals and they're very, I mean, Ted Kaczynski was a lone wolf, right? Yes. I mean, that's a... Brevik, arguably. And Brevik, yeah, Brevik, yeah. But, and Bo, I mean, Brevik and Kaczynski, I mean, and I guess, you know, Bruce Ivins was a lone wolf as well. But these tend to be highly idios idiosyncratic. Yeah. I mean, they're, they really are social misfits. They can't. It just, it's just interesting to me. With I think with the internet, it's, it's the likelihood of you being a lone wolf goes down because yeah. you're going to try and reach out to a like-minded. <laughs> Well, the, there are a few outlier cases of overlap, overlapping interests. It's extraordinarily unusual. It's extraordinarily unusual. There was a guy called Jeffrey Bryce who is an admirer both of uh, Timothy McVeigh and Osama bin Laden who was recently, he blew him, he tried to blow up, a, he was building a bomb and he basically blew himself up. But it was Ahmed Hoover, uh, who was a Muslim Brotherhood figure who was a former neo-Nazi. Um, Anti-Semitism can give these guys something to talk about. They're, in terms of really recruiting in that pool, no. I mean, you see the occasional crossover and you see the occasional enemy of my enemy kind of mostly talk and not very much action. Um, you know, and the, the, the obvious case that it sort of everybody was always been interested in and I've been interested in too is the Oklahoma City bombing because as you may be aware, I, Terry Nichols, basically, I can put Terry Nichols and Ramsey Youssef within 300 feet and two days of each other in the Philippines, but I can't tell you they were in the same room. This has yeah. sparked a lot of speculation over the years, and I mean, I have, after really spending a lot of time and resources on it, I have come to the tentative conclusion that it didn't happen. Yeah. Uh, and also, there are such a things there are merely coincidences. There are merely coincidences. I, uh, you know, when I was investigating uh, different uh, relative of Jamal Khalifa, actually, the gentleman he was staying with when he was in San Francisco, um, I discovered this was a case that I put a lot of time and energy into a uh, whole separate can of worms. But I found out that his, his nephew who he was staying with in, in California was living in an apartment complex that I lived in a couple of years later. <laughs> so, so coincidences happen. Jamal Khalifa was Osama bin Laden's brother-in-law and, um, just, uh, and uh, the subject of quite a lot of law enforcement interest, who was mysteriously murdered in Mad Madagascar in 2007. Yeah, I wanted to do a book on that, but uh, well, no In takers. the back. Hi, Midia Benjamin with Code Pink. Uh, I was interested when you talked about al Alaki having been radicalized before 9-11, uh, because the story that's come out by his family is that it was the response to 9-11, the invasion of Iraq, the Abu Ghraib abuses, those kinds of things. If you could talk to that. And also, could you just say a little bit more about uh, the Somalis from Minneapolis? Um, it seems like such a warm, embracing city that would be welcoming of... Uh, of uh, diverse communities, you know, why there and, and are these young uh, men people who were born there or came there at a certain age? And a little more about that, thank you. So, as far as Alaki, uh, th this is a guy who left an unbelievable body of work <laughs> behind him. He did so many audio recordings, lectures, writings, uh, a lot of his sermons were recorded, a lot of the people he talked to, and what you see is prior to 9-11 is that a lot of the same themes that were already there, you know, that would later emerge uh, in a terrorist context were already there in kind of a radical context. So, you know, you got radicalism and you got terrorism and radicalism is this big and terrorism is this big. 
and there's we understand there to be a relationship between these things, but radicalism is not necessarily a good way to diagnose who's going to be terrorist because radicalism is so big and terrorism is so small. Um, so his content, stuff that he had done, uh, some of these religious lectures and stuff, if you actually go and listen to the 20, 30, 40 hours of them, which I, I did. Uh, Were they all the same? No, they're different. Uh, he uses different kinds of subjects. So he did one on uh, the hereafter, which is you know sort of the afterlife, and that's like six hours. And then he would do the lives of the prophets, and they w that would be eight hours. And you hear sort of the rationalizations and the supportive arguments that, that go into this. And then in addition to this, there's the FOIA documents that show that uh, he had been in contact with Ziad Khalil, who uh, had been a procurement agent for Al-Qaeda. And there were some, he was, had some connection with Al-Aki that, that has been redacted out of the documents that I've read. Uh, I find the FOIA process, while it's great that we have a Freedom of Information Act, uh, it's often very difficult to get a, a really clear picture of what goes on. So there's a lot of smoke on that. But there's really no fire until some years after 9-11, uh, and until really, uh, Seems like when he went to London, he sort of became yeah. more radicalized. Yeah. And then he went to prison in Yemen. And so he sort of like there were things that w would come up as themes in his earlier speeches that became more and more visible as you as you went through over time. Um, in addition to sort of the network connections that kind of suggest more. And I did a longer piece, uh, a piece for The Atlantic on this a couple of years ago, which is linked off of my website at jmberger.com that has more than has everything written down in uh, more detail than I can remember it sitting here. Um, as far as Minneapolis, the Somali diaspora community is is very uh, close-knit community. There's a lot of interaction back with the homeland and a lot of these kids that went, at least some of them were involved in gang activity and kind of criminal activity. And when you look at some of the court cases, some of them went back to Somalia to take part in criminal activity for profit. And then when they got there, they found out they were being recruited into Al-Shabaab. Um, Al-Shabaab is a strange movement because it's very nationalistic for a jihadist movement. It's very Somali-centric in a way that some other jihadist movements usually are more about the global community. And Shabaab talks that game pretty well, but I think that they also have a really deeply nationalistic and tribal approach. So a lot of these are tribal family community connections and uh, I mean from what I've been able to see that that cluster is kind of re all related to that to those sorts of uh, really deep ties with diaspora. Shabab puts a lot of effort into recruiting Somali diaspora from around the world and when they get there they're treated a lot better than they aren't treated as foreign fighters they're treated as members of Al-Shabab so there's one guy from Minnesota who I track online who uh, you know, if you look at his Facebook page, you would think that jihad is a pretty great adventure because while al-Shabaab was blocking famine relief efforts to the rest of the country, he was posting pictures of his meals, his fabulous meals, and uh, pictures of him running on the beaches where it's not safe for people to go anymore, but safe for him because he's in al-Shabaab. He's got which, a little pot, pot belly, uh, Abdullahi Farah. Uh, he was friends with uh, Hamami, and they had a falling out after Hamami fell out with Shabab. Farah basically stayed with Shabab. You know, uh, just um, following up on Medea's question about, I mean, the, a lot of these kids come from Cedar Riverside neighborhood in Minneapolis, which is probably one of the poorest uh, parts of the United States. I think average incomes are $17,000 a year for a family, 20% unemployment. I mean, this is not the American, you know, most American Muslims really are living the American dream. Yeah. Uh, this is not the case for the Somali American community in, in Minneapolis. So that, <coughs> and then you have the uh, Ethi Ethiopian army invading was. <coughs> I mean, gangs, you know, and gangs really are, gang dynamics are very similar to terrorist group dynamics in a lot of ways. So if you have experience in gang culture and you can find a nexus to that more kind of religious extremism, uh, you kind of already have the, some of the mental preparation that would get you into that space. <coughs> what got these guys to go was the Ethiopian army invading, right? Yeah. And that was, the, that was the kind of 
tr switch point in 06. Yeah, there's a, there's a trigger, there's, there's a lot of different triggers. Shabab likes to present itself as a defensive movement. Um, and the surrounding African countries have, to some extent, made it easy for them to do that. So Shabab was the militant wing of the Islamic Courts Union, which was a predecessor group, Islamist group that was basically doing a pretty good job of governing a pretty good chunk of Somalia prior to 2007. And because it was an Islamist group, Western countries in general, but also Ethiopia and Kenya, who have to deal with this as a neighbor situation, it's much more pressing for them, sort of like, no way. We don't want these guys in there. So they helped undermine and ultimately defeat the Islamic Courts Union, which allowed the militant branch of that group, al-Shabaab, to rise up in its place. And so you got something much more virulent after the, after the ICU went down. Other question? Hi, my name is uh, Paul Hidalgo. Um, I was wondering how, how effective you thought uh, Hamami was with the rank and file. You know, as the drama was going on, it was difficult to assess exactly what his effect was. Um, I know he ticked off the leadership, obviously, but in your opinion, did it did it have a lasting effect? Um, next. Well, Hamami had been on the pro side when he was uh, in, in the, the video that really made him famous with the rap song in it. Uh, became insanely popular. So he was a big draw for Al Shabaab uh, in the early days. So much so that they released subsequent rap videos performed by another member of Al Shabaab and put his picture on him and his name on him and said it was Somali, even though it wasn't. Which is, he got to be infamous for a bunch of videos that he didn't do. Uh, so his his fall from grace has had a lot of reverberations, some of which are kind of immediately apparent and some of which are less so. Uh, you know, the most obvious thing is just that it has created a lot of dissent, uh, especially in the online communities, because when he first posted his video call for help, people tried to post it to the forums, the jihadist forums, message boards, and they were ruthlessly suppressed by the administrators of those forums. Um, and other dissenters have also been ruthlessly suppressed. And so these kinds of incidents are one thing that has driven the growth in social media use by, by jihadists because they want to talk in a, talk in a forum where they, they can't be censored. So they go on Twitter and they go on Facebook instead. He had supporters in Somalia who were on Twitter who were talking and he did not, it did, what, from what I tracked, I tracked everybody he talked to in addition to the things he said and people who directed tweets at him in addition to just the ones he responded to. It did not seem to me that he was attracting widespread support from Western jihadis and Westernized jihadis and people who were sympathetic on that front. He had support within Somalia. Uh, many of those supporters are now dead. Um, a lot of them were also, Al-Shabaab knocked out the cell towers for a while so that nobody could get on Twitter. Uh, so the, the rebellion that he was a part of was not, uh, did not start with him and did not really revolve around him, even though for us it did because we were all obsessed with him. But it was the senior members of Al-Shabaab rising up against Godan and Hamami was part of that movement. So he became a rallying cry for them. So members of the movement, uh, Ibrahim al Afghani, and uh, and then several senior leaders, including Owais and Robo, uh, signed a fatwa saying that it was haram to kill Hamami. Uh, so they they used him as part of that media drive. The issue is that now that all the, all these guys are dead or in government custody, except for Robo. Um, is there anybody left who's, who's really got the, is upset enough to stand up for this? There are people in Somalia who are not happy about what happened, but it's not clear that they value unity more than they value necessarily getting justice in this case. Um, if nothing else is a recruiter, you know, he's no longer a recruiting tool for them. Uh, he's been taken off the board in that sense, but you know, I didn't see like a, and, and he did, he won a fair amount of support online, but I don't see 
a huge movement, uh, you know, kind of counter jihadi movement coming out of this right now. But I think that we'll find ways to use this to bring that message to people. And there is definitely a, a strong dissenting faction online and offline that, that really was never visible to us before that has come to light because of him. Dissenting from Al-Shabaab's... Yes. By the way, does, was the attack on the Eastgate Mall in Nairobi a sign of Shabaab weakness or strength? I suspect that Shabaab's increased pace of attacks in the last six months, both in Somalia and in the mall attack, um, I would say that that is probably in part a result of the fact that they have faced an incredible amount of criticism from within the jihadi community, really almost unprecedented amount of criticism from other jihadis over the conduct of this dissent. Um, and they wanted to change the story from Al-Shabaab kills its own to Al-Shabaab kills the Crusaders. On that cheerful note, we'll thank JM very much for that uh, very interesting presentation. And he's got books outside and he's willing to sign them. Thank you. Thank you.